The dinosaurs first appeared during the late Triassic. They were not the rulers of the world till another mass extinction fully knocked out the surviving stragglers from the Permian mass extinction. So, before the dinosaurs even appeared, the rulers of the world were the archosaurs, the cousins and forebears to the true dinosaurs. Many of them looked quite a lot like dinosaurs, with some even being the first to some evolutionary body plans, while many more were so bizarre as to be nearly fantastical. As more of these flat-footed, armored beasts are found, the understanding of these ancient ecosystems becomes more and more complicated with all sorts of unique groups. Let's add a brand new one from the petrified coasts of what is now Nevada. There are certain ecological niches, habitats, and taphonomic processes that I think are commonly associated with certain times and the fossil deposits that date to those times. Whale falls are relatively common and incredibly important parts of the marine nutrient cycles, but these sorts of things have been going on since the dawn of time. Large marine animals have been dying and sinking to the bottom for smaller things to munch on since life first started to vary in size. Rainforests, mountains, and beaches have always been especially important places for life to thrive and diversify. The beachcombing lifestyle hasn't only been relegated to gulls, crabs, and crocodiles. I'm sure this sort of generalist scavenging lifestyle has existed since life first scuttled onto land. You can see I'm really stretching for a tenuous connection between an opener and the topic I want to mosey on into. A beachcombing lifestyle in the fossil record is difficult to tell from any other terrestrial animal. You can make an educated guess or inference as to the life habits of an animal based on its anatomy, a handful of quantitative tests you can run, and sometimes the where and the how of a specimen's preservation. A carcass being found in marine sediments doesn't inherently mean it lived in the ocean or near it. After all, plenty of fully terrestrial dinosaur carcasses are found in sediments that were relatively far out to sea. Okay, but maybe the critter has some anatomical traits that aren't super specialized for land living, running, or climbing, so you could infer it was a generalist and may have lived near the ocean it died in. Then look at its food processors. Does it have teeth for eating slippery sea animals? Maybe that can give you an even better idea as to whether or not it was more of a beachcomber or it's a complete coincidence that it ended up floating out to sea. Such finds are rare, but they do happen. During the Triassic period, the continents were fused into the supercontinent Pangaea. However, there were plenty of islands, small inland seas, and big giant lakes that cut up the inhabitants. For example, there were the semi-isolated Paleotethes and Tethys Oceans on the east coast of Pangaea. Plenty of Archosaurian reptiles have been uncovered from ocean and beach deposits from this eastern half of the continent, but none have been found on the other coast, along what was the Panthalassan Ocean, a giant ocean that spanned most of the surface of the Earth, unabated by normal-sized continents as it is today. It was in rock deposits from right off the coast of the western part of Pangaea that the first Middle Triassic coastally associated terrestrial animal was found by a team of paleontologists prospecting near the top of the north slope of Favret Canyon in the Augusta Mountains of Pershing County, Nevada. This team of researchers, which included Nathan Smith, Nicole Klein, P. Martin Sander, and large Schmitz were excavating in the fossil hill member of the Favret Formation, which has been tentatively dated with biostratigraphy to the late Anician stage of the Middle Triassic, so around 244 to 243 million years ago, when they hit fossil gold in the form of specimen LECM DL158616, the partially articulated skeleton of a large archosaurian. Once the specimen was excavated and field prepared, the team brought it back to the LA County Museum for further preparation and description. As fossil preparators chipped away brownish-gray sediment from the blocks containing the specimen, they found they had collected a few minor skull bones, 
such as the prefrontals, frontal, and parietal bone, as well as most of the axial column, shoulder and pelvic girdles, and large chunks of the forelimbs. Once the research team was able to photograph, measure, and identify all the bones and the traits they preserve, they were confident they had a new animal on their hands and published the critter as Bangwig Wishingasuchus eremicarminus in a July 2024 paper in Biology Letters of the Royal Society Publishing. I know I just brushed past that whopper of a name, so let me circle on back to that. The genus name is derived from a cultural mashup of the Shoshone term Bengui, Gwishinga, which means to catch fish, and the Greek sukis for crocodile. So the crocodile that catches fish. The species name is in honor of Elaine Kramer and Monica Schaefer, but interestingly not in reference to their names. Instead, the species name is composed of the Latin Erima and Carminus, which translates to desert song. Hey, who said things needed to be simple to say? Pray for me as I continue to blabber on about this animal. The authors tallied up all of the traits preserved in the carcass and placed it in a phylogenetic software among the traits of a bunch of other archosaurs. And that found that Benguiguishingasuchus specifically belongs to the Poposauroidea in between the Tanzanian Mandasuchus and the Chinese Chionosuchus. It's thanks to this classification that some of the missing elements of Benguiguishingasuchus can be generalized. Based on its fossils and relatives, Benguiguishingasuchus seemed to have a rather long neck but short back. It also had expanded ends of the humerus, with a humerus that was short compared to the femur. Some of this animal's osteoderm armor was also preserved, indicating the critter carried around a double row of bony armor underneath the skin along the center of the back. These under-the-skin pieces of bone were likely covered in a sheath of keratin, but it's possible no keratin was present. Unfortunately, the skull is missing, besides a few minor bones, so what the animal's face looked like is entirely speculative and has to be inferred from close relatives, both of which have long, shallow noggins with wavy kinks and jaw margins. With as little as can be inferred about its appearance, how much can be inferred of its size? Let's bring in Mr. Man from Animal Planets the Most Extreme to give you an idea. Based on the fossil measurements, its close relatives, and some math formulae, the authors estimate Benguiguishingasuchus was around 1.5 meters, 4 feet 11 inches long when it died. Thanks, Mr. Man. The author team conducted an histologic analysis on the bones of Benguiguishingasuchus by slicing up a very thin cutting through the humerus, then polishing the slice after it had been adhered to a glass slide until it reached a certain thickness, and then observing it under different wavelengths of light through a microscope. They found that this animal was around 8 years old when it died, and went through a slow growth rate as it aged, inferring a low metabolic rate, heavily dependent on the environment. So, based on the skeleton and the histologic samples of said bones, the authors are confident Benguiguishingasuchus was a fully terrestrial animal with little to no adaptations for living in water, neither amphibious nor aquatic. However, they infer that it is a distinct possibility that the animal was adapting to live in the vicinity of water and to maybe take advantage of the great resources the ocean provided. More evidence of this hypothesis is the fact that a handful of other seemingly definitively terrestrial archosaurs have been found in marine sediments, and none of them seem to carry super-terrestrially specialized anatomy. In other words, they weren't huge, bulky herbivores like dinosaurs or something weird like an ichthyosaur. The Middle Triassic of Nevada was a coastal environment. Lots of marine reptiles have been recovered from the same deposit as Benguiguishingasuchus, including remains of four species of Symbospondylus, two species of Omphalosaurus, two species of Philarodon, and Thalatoarchan. The early Sauropterygian, Augustosaurus, was also found from these sediments. Aside from these named vertebrates, bony fish and sharks have also been recovered, and there were plenty of ammonites and shelled invertebrates to go around. A whole bunch of good reasons for Benguiguishingasuchus to try to make a name for itself along the coasts. 
For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.